لاجواد It's 5 a.m. at Dubai International Airport, and the motley crowd of businessmen, journalists, and humanitarian aid workers gathers at the snack bar. The mood is friendly and pleasant for so early in the morning. All friends joke and laugh, and as the local mullah leads the call to prayer outside, a strange pilgrimage begins within. A mysterious character with white shirt and black briefcase sets up shop at a nearby table. And though no one says a word, everyone knows the cash-strapped Afghan Ariana Airlines is open for business. One person who's been waiting a lifetime for this moment is Seema Wali. Well. Having escaped death during the 1978 Marxist coup, she managed to flee for her life as family and friends succumbed to execution, torture, and imprisonment. Now, after 24 years, Seema is returning to Kabul, only this time to face the new and even more challenging step of helping to rebuild her shattered nation. Accompanied by close friends Liz Gould, Paul Fitzgerald, and Michelle Andina, it's an adventure she both relishes and fears. Uh, this was meant to be, I told you this. Going back to Kabul. Another big supporter. Yes, we're all, we're all in it together. <laughs> the four apostles here. Yes, we really need each other, and I know I couldn't have done it without your support, because this is going to be a very emotionally draining and a difficult trip returning after 23 years but having worked on the issue for so many years and knowing how devastated Afghanistan is so you're all my emotional support thank you for agreeing to be with us I'm very excited to share this with Seema that's yeah yeah, yeah definitely yeah predicted it pre 9-11 but even as the aged 727 sets out over the rugged countryside, Seema's immense enthusiasm for the task ahead turns everyone's apprehension into a sense of positive excitement. I'm hopeful, I am apprehensive, and I know I'll be devastated by the destruction that I have been trying to be in denial, I suppose. And that is, I know it will hit me very hard, but I'm also hopeful that I will be able to help those that are returning back to Afghanistan, especially the women who are trying to rebuild um, a devastated country and really rebuild the lives of the Afghan people. Memories flood back as Sima glimpses her homeland again. But as the plane nears Kabul, the stark reality of what was once a vibrant city comes home. Good. <laughs> as president and founder of the Washington, D.C.-based Refugee Women in Development, REFWIT, Seema has worked tirelessly for the human rights of Afghanistan's women and for over 20 years has been a strong and consistent voice for democratic and moderate-minded Afghans. But the danger signs of reconstructing the country are everywhere and Seema must now measure the ideals of the new Afghanistan against the reality of a society governed by 23 years of violence. After a brief stop at the foreign ministry, the search begins for a suitable spot to hold her training seminar. But the ruined state of the city remains a problem that must be overcome. After years of drought, water is at a premium, while electric service remains spotty at best. With 75% of the city destroyed in the war, available space is nearly non-existent, and what little there is must be restored after years of abuse. The pain suffered by the people of Kabul surrounds you as you travel the city, and Seema translated as our driver remembered the long and terrible war as if it were just yesterday. He was showing us his home and he said he had uh, undergone some serious traumatic events. I mean, when Gulbuddin was shelling the city uh, about uh, seven, eight years ago, they actually had, this, they were uh, having a funeral and had to bring the mullah uh, to uh, say the last rites for this young uh, child who had been killed in, in the shellings and the shelling started getting heavier and they had to immediately I mean they had to dig a grave and there were three men who had who had to hide in the grave and he was talking when in this area that he was showing us basically uh, there were two uh, a mother and a daughter that were seriously uh, hurt and they were bleeding and how he took them and had to risk his life to take them to the hospital and he said that uh, many of his relatives who had sought refuge in Islamabad were asking him, pleading with him to come and, and leave uh, the city because of the dangers and he said he never left the city and the sites and um, that he um, 
witnessed were horrific. He will never forget what he witnessed during those times. At a French-run center called Aina, which means mirror in Dari, Sima negotiates for one of the few usable function halls. But the chances are slim. A former Taliban prison, the entire compound faces an extensive restoration process and is only one of a handful of facilities, the pleasant surroundings are in constant demand. No less in demand are the local non-governmental organizations, the so-called NGOs, that SEMA has come to assist. Born out of a desperate need during the war, organizations like the Afghan Institute for Learning, AIL, provide training and educational services to the community that the newly formed Afghan government has yet to fund. Operating from Pakistan during Taliban rule, Sakina Yakubi and her staff now struggle to keep up with the growing demand in Kabul. But Seema fears that the success of the local non-governmental organizations now operating in Afghanistan may be undermined by forces far beyond her classrooms. Uh, notion that there is no need for um, local community-based groups to do education and do training and informal education, that the government must, must handle anything, everything. One night I was putting my head on the pillow. I was thinking, oh my God, what will happen? What is this? And the next morning I said, no, we have to keep doing. We can't stop and back up, you know, because that is we are here for. And if we really want to... Um, be effective, we have to face a lot of problems. That is it. It's not going to be easy. People are just coming every day. Yesterday, Khadija told me that there is uh, seven other students who want to register for preschool. And it's just, we are jammed. We don't have enough space. Uh, your time is short, and now we have another appointment. Uh, yes. Like, we have 20 minutes, if we can yes. quickly go around. Welcome to AIA. After more than an hour with Sakina, Sima has learned of the broad spectrum of subtleties needed to get Afghanistan up and running again. But Sima also knows that educating women and children is only part of what must be done to overcome the war and a Taliban political system that condemned women to a life of ignorance and poverty. At the Women's Organization for a Mutual Afghan Network, Sima finds expatriate Mina Shirzoy attempting to bring modern systems analysis to the deeply ingrained problems of employment in the Afghan economy. I was curious where these women are and what are they doing because all you see them is around on the streets and a few of them in the ministries and that's it and how can you touch them and how can you get to them mm -hmm. and I was always also thinking of how am I going to create something or do something for these people that's going to be long term effective mm -hmm. not short term. But even with Mina's expertise in data and marketing she receives no outside financial support, despite her continuing efforts to raise donor money. Where do you get your funding for this? I mean, it's... I don't know money. yet. I have yeah. a, I'm writing proposals. Thank God you guys came to me to, <laughs> <laughs> to help me out. God was listening to me. <laughs> and Seema finds that her program for self-empowerment can assist in helping Mina make the connections vital to her project's success. What you want to do is selective maybe four or five women NGOs that will be part of a training process, mm -hmm. and then um, get the ones that are most, uh, select the ones that are most legitimate, mm -hmm. to then work directly with the women-headed households. We give them tiny grants of $200 each. Wonderful. And on the basis of that, we want you, that NGO, women's NGO, to be monitoring. Mm -hmm. Despite the war and the destruction, Kabul is teeming with life. But the influx of thousands of refugees makes the mission of finding those who can benefit most from SEMA's training that much more urgent. It's a time-consuming and exhaustive process. But by constantly rearranging her schedule to accommodate the growing list of NGOs, SEMA's program is quickly beginning to gel. Sorry about that. No, but I will just shift my meeting because this is a priority and would love to talk with you more, first to meet with you. At the Ministry of Women's Affairs, Sima meets with prospective participants and over the sounds of hammers and saws explains the details of what she has come 5,000 miles to teach. Still under construction after suffering heavy bomb damage during the war, it's hoped this ministry will become the nerve center for a whole new era of Afghan women's rights. This first meeting is a vital exchange for both sides to learn what each has to offer and the women waste no time in articulating their specific needs.
Shafika Habibi, a pioneer for women's rights and Afghan television's first anchor woman, joins the dialogue on this first day to encourage the women to participate. But over lunch, Shafika admits the uphill struggle for human rights in post-Taliban Afghanistan has just begun. And she herself sits on a committee to uh, uh, influence the media, and she uh, requested at least four prominent women who were previously active in um, these sectors be allowed to um, uh, represent themselves and the, um, the committee and the group that was uh, overseen by the warlords and the extremists basically said, no, that is not possible. But despite the latest wave of repressive restrictions by the new Afghan government, the process of bringing women of Afghanistan into the 21st century is well underway. At the Afghan Women's Welfare Department, Seema's heart swells at the sights and sounds of the new Afghanistan. Fabulous. I mean, this is why I do this work. I come to Kabul after 23 years and I see my Afghan sister sitting behind the computer and it, it renews my hope and it's very inspiring to me that I was just talking to them and they were telling me that they come from very far distances and they're very clear about their goals that they want to learn computers. This um, uh, lady was telling me about why she wants to learn computers. Her, uh, she's uh, an agriculturist, and this way she can access information and link up with the other experts uh, in the world. And they go to great pains to make it transportation-wise to the center. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm very energized. Well, riding 17, yes? So you have to look at the pictures, and you have to, let's say, complete the sentences. Here, women who traveled from all over the country learn the language skills and computer techniques that will connect the remotest villages to the World Wide Web, thus beginning the transformation that has eluded Afghanistan for millennia. But even a year after the brief war that made scenes like this once again possible, the memories of that terrible time still linger. Learn your English right now. Um, before, before the yes. uh, Taliban regime. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and a war no. And war we are in the bombarding of uh, American. We are in here. You were because, here. Yes, because there uh, no way to go there. Uh -huh. the, all of the um, uh, way of uh, Pakistan and uh, Iran and of, all, all of the ways uh, closed. So you uh, stayed here the whole time. Uh, yes, and we are afraid a lot. And uh, we said uh, we think we are uh, we died. Where did but, you? Where uh, did but you God live? save us. Where? In those first few days, wherever Seema goes, she finds great hope and joy in the accomplishments of these women and men, and her enthusiasm for them is returned in kind. We are happy to see you. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> but the stark realities of what must be done to rebuild Afghanistan are everywhere. And in addition to narrowing down the candidates for her workshop, Seema must also assess the basic needs for the rebuilding of an entire Afghan infrastructure ruined by two decades of war. These needs are no more apparent than at the Alauddin Orphanage, where Seema encounters a woman begging to have her daughters admitted to an overcrowded facility where 800 children survive on a meager diet without shoes, running water, or electricity. Uh, this is the mother of these two kids, nine years old and seven years old. She's uh, sweeping floors, she says, and the father uh, is no longer arrived. And she wants to be, uh, she wants to admit her two girls here so she can be safe. If they don't even have an older brother to take care of them while she goes out and works. She wants them to go to class and be taken care of and be safe in the center. Seema negotiates on behalf of the woman. But with the facility already operating at twice its capacity, there's little she can do but offer compensation and hope the beleaguered staff will make good on its promise to admit the girls within two weeks' time. Scenes like this are common in Afghanistan today, where the traditional social structure has collapsed. And as Seema tours the orphanage, she struggles to balance the needs of the children against the unpleasant realities of the situation. And this guy was saying, well, if you buy if you give us the money, we'll buy uh, meat for them because they, they don't have meat here. Uh, the kids never get to eat protein. We will buy it for them. How do I know that this will be done? After 24 years of war, the issues facing this country are staggering. But the crushing impact on the women, children, and culture of Afghanistan is nearly incomprehensible. <laughs> Claro.
I needed to see this because what I'm doing, helping, trying to help those that are trying to help rebuild Afghanistan, but I cannot forget this. And I needed to accept the reality of my country. It's not just what I see, the positivity. The people have a lot of hope and we are trying to rebuild, but we also have this destruction and it's, it's our responsibility to build from here. For the next few hours, Sima tours the ravaged landscape of her home city. The vanished gardens of the Dar al Aman Palace, where she used to picnic with family and friends, and where Russian special forces parachuted on the night of December 27th, 1979. That's a nice big bomb crater right there, sitting right over here. The road's knocked out right there, you gotta go around it. The world famous Kabul Museum where the brilliance of 5,000 years of Afghan history was dynamited into dust by the Taliban. Mm -hmm. He's trying to glue it back together here, piece by piece. It's a lonely task in a dark, cold building. When you look above him, this is what he's dealing with. stone block bearing two inscriptions in the Greek alphabet. The inscription repeats the Delphic precepts from the oracle at Delphi. As children learn good behavior, as young men self-control. In middle age, be just. In old age, give wise advice. Then meet death without regret. These are words I'm afraid that were lost on people who did this. Oh, my God. This is what's left. This is what the Taliban were doing to this country. These are the pieces. Two people were killed because they wouldn't tell the Taliban where this head was. Yeah. Mm. This is Buddha. Yeah. What century? Three. In the period of 1991 to 1995, there was the fighting against each other in Afghanistan, it was broke in that time. And the you know, sculpture and the other things, the people looted from here. So this is, this is all that's left of the Kabul Museum. But even more tragic than the ruined palaces and the gutted remains are the unfulfilled promises made to the Afghan people following the defeat of the Taliban. With the arrival of the international community following the war, hope exploded throughout the country. But now, even the streets of Kabul seem less secure. And though the smiling faces of European soldiers maintain an illusion of safety, it's not the way Seema remembers the Kabul streets or the Afghanistan that she was forced to flee. All of this, the, the, the entire block, my um, aunt used to own it. They were beautiful uh, res a restaurant up on top there and then there were stores and they they had their own apartments that they used to live in so it was a beautiful well-built clean wide street with trees all around there were so many trees and there was so much green and cleanliness now we can walk over we can cross this busy street this is it i remember i remember from the window and the old owner of course has passed away this is where I used to keep a running tab. I would just come from school, buy stuff, and then go home, and he would keep a tab without me signing onto anything. I mean, the level of trust was at, at that level. So at the end of the month or at the end of the few months, I would remember, and he would never ask. So we would come and pay him back. And this is how, how the system worked, the trust system, the honor system. At the end of a long but promising week, Seema's return to her old neighborhood holds many surprises. This is my neighborhood. This was a, another large house that they've demolished and now we have a mosque there. Asia Foundation was right there. The world from which she drew her strength, even the houses she grew up in have long since vanished. But Seema's experience as a young girl in Afghanistan provided her with the strength and unique appreciation of Afghan cultural diversity that she's dedicated to restoring to her homeland. Actually, I mean, I remember now that we had just at that end of the block 
uh, an Afghan Jewish family living that were very good friends with my family and I would actually cross the street and play with their children and they would come and visit us. But even though separated by time and distance and war, a magic still remains on the street that Seema once knew as home. And as she recalls the past, it seems to spring back to life. This was a huge compound and it was absolutely beautiful. We had, they had uh, absolutely beautiful dogs and we used to spend a lot of time, especially uh, high tea was an important social event where we would spend a lot of time uh, with uh, the family there and I think that's that's a relative of mine right there I'm not sure let me ask let me ask oh my god 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 so I just got here and I went upstairs to check the apartment I just opened the window and I couldn't imagine. I opened the window and I see somebody looks like Sima. <laughs> and I just called her name and I was kind of scared. Maybe it's not Sima. Somebody <laughs> said, you know, how come you're uh, you know, yelling at a lady? Down. The other uh, person said, are you sure that this is your cousin? I said, yeah, yeah, she looks like exactly my cousin. <laughs> and this is like a dream. That's a dream amazing. come true, really. Well, it's, maybe it's meant. It's um, it, it meant to be. Meant to it me. meant to yes. be exactly yes. in this intersection. We could have two minutes ago. We could have you, actually. You could have been there. We were I, going that way. I said no. I want to go down this to see basically oh. the place where I spent. The More faces time. reappear, yeah. recalling yeah. wonderful yeah. memories that give yeah. Seema strength yeah. and hope yeah. that her yeah. Afghanistan but is I still alive. Remember an old guard. He was oh, very God. sweet. <laughs> he used to guard the front door when we'd come in, and I can't believe it. He's still here. And she's been here 40 years. I used to see her in the hallways. It was behind these walls of the French middle school that Seema first learned to connect to her own sense of independence as an Afghan woman, a process that would become doomed under the Taliban. There was, he's saying that the, during the time of the Taliban, the, the school was totally demolished, um, and, and now they have reconstructed it on the same old model. And I remember this, I remember the playground, this is where the younger students, the French, because this is a French uh, administered and supported school. I remember we had French teachers uh, and my classes was very good. We had brilliant students in French and I remember being a pet of the, of the French teacher. Uh, we were both rowdy and a, and a brilliant class. I remember my classroom was in the back and there were these beautiful trees, of a, um, uh, beautiful flowers. In French they call it eglantine. I don't know what they call it in, in English. And in those surroundings we would study. The interesting thing about the school is that at that time we had both the uh, members of the royal family and their maids all study in one class. So there was that discrimination uh, between ethnic and classes really was dispelled once you entered the um, doors of the school and we had a very open society where discrimination really did not exist at the level that now exists. Uh, unfortunately, ethnicity has become uh, a major issue of conflict among the Afghans. Ethnicity, women's rights, poverty, lack of education, lack of employment and warlordism are just some of the issues impeding the reconstruction of Afghan society. But as Seema continues to search for candidates, she's repeatedly impressed by the grassroots efforts that have held Afghan society together against overwhelming odds. I learned English in a bad situation, in Taliban situation. In Taliban regime, I started to learn English, and on that time, it was so difficult for us to learn English. And we learned English by a special teacher that uh, he came to our house, and we learned English. On it that, was a man. Yeah, yeah, he was a man, and he was so afraid that if the Taliban had known about our studying, they would, uh, yeah, you know, dot dot. Yes. Dot, dot, yes. yes. <laughs> Sheltered in a mud-walled adobe fort near the airport, Seema discovers a locally run NGO at the Educational Training Center for the Poor Women and Girls of Afghanistan, whose capable management would put a major corporation to shame, providing services and job training to the local community under harsh Taliban rule 
with absolutely no outside funding or support. She, she said something important that the reason she continued her resistance uh, despite the darkness of the period because she had hope and she felt that after this period of darkness uh, a period would emerge where democracy uh, would be secured and they would be free as women to continue and raise their voice and be active in their society. And we need as refuge to make sure that a group like this is uh, uh, recognized in the Western world and among the donors. They're doing excellent work and they're actually supported in the community and their services are based on community needs. From her more than two decades of experience, Seema knows that indigenous organizations like this contain the primary knowledge base needed to rebuild Afghan society. But balancing the demands of the selection process against her own needs and feelings makes her job in Kabul that much more difficult. How do you feel after yesterday? Is your sense of it? It's just kind of hard. I still have not digested in fully what mm -hmm. really the um, issues and the feelings are. I mean, I'm still sort of working on it. I mean, I fluctuate between mm -hmm. hope and despair and between uh, my own exhaustion and trying to keep up with the schedule and trying to deliver things on time. And, given the fact that their communications is very difficult here. Um, but hoping that, I mean, under the circumstances, um, we're getting in, I mean, help from people, and people are understanding, so we're able to shift uh, our schedule. And uh, But I think for tomorrow, uh, we're just working with our um, local partner, uh, organizing the schedule for tomorrow and making sure that we have uh, everything, the logistics all, uh, player, we st I still need to iron out a few of those um, issues, but I think we'll be okay once this training starts. Although the promised international aid has failed to materialize, the self-determination of individual Afghans like Sima to quickly re-establish Afghan culture can already be felt on Kabul streets. I was in Bosnia also several times, and if you compare Bosnia to Afghanistan, I think in the last seven months here in Afghanistan has been more uh, rebuilding, reconstruction than in the last seven years in Bosnia. Yeah, if you look at the people, they're all everywhere working very hard, rebuilding everything. That's yeah, yeah. very good. He wants you to take his show. Sure. Wow. Nice. Oh, look at the jewelry here. One, one piece of picture, give me for me. Good morning. Good morning. Is this your father? Okay. Okay, here's your picture. Is it good? Yes. Yeah, yeah. This is Afghani. Very Afghani. Yes. Afghani, yeah. 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 <laughs> That's no spoon. No, no spoon. No spoon. Yes. Okay. Returning from exile, Abdullah Shirzoy shares a sense of obligation and hope for the rebuilding by conducting classes for the local shoeshine boys on the front steps of his hotel. The reason I'm here is because uh, I thought this was a great opportunity to further my education. Um, not as an academic neurologist, but as a human being. Although just a personal effort, Abdullah's lessons demonstrate the capacity and desire of the Afghan children for learning, as well as an understanding that the only way out of poverty for these boys is through education. These kids are stuck in a cycle of poverty where they can't afford not to work. <clears throat> especially during the peak hours of the day where if they don't work during those hours and go to school they don't have a livelihood for their parents, for their mom, for their dad. Some of the kids here on the, in front of this uh, hotel their fathers have passed away so they're, they become the source of income at a very early age so they have to go uh, to work. No foolishness, yes, I check this ago, I have But no matter how bright or enthusiastic or how dedicated the efforts by men like Abdullah the future for Jahed and an entire generation of Afghan women and children rests on the success of the local NGOs. But without funding and outside support, the chances of rebuilding Afghan civil society are bleak. Sound mind is in a sound body. In appreciation of Seema's hard work, the French-run multicultural center Aina comes through with the desperately needed facility to make the workshop happen. So here's Stoiba, the veteran educator, joins the team to conduct the classes. What do you think are the two most important things you need during the next year? Two only most important things that you need to do your work well. And as the program begins and the workshop takes shape, Seema's concerns are dispelled.
but we have to respect the wishes of the locals and, and the dynamics that there is really taking place here locally. But all in all, I'm pleased with it. Um, tomorrow will be a much more organized way. We'll start uh, on time. They understand that process. Um, so I think we'll be okay. SEMA's success is no small accomplishment. Within the calm pastel courtyard of Vina, reminders still linger of the recent occupiers that nearly eradicated Afghan culture. Aina's director, Alexander Plichon, explained Aina's purpose. And we came in, we've always come in with this idea of uh, opening up uh, a place. Uh, the example we had in mind was the Casa, Casa de Cultura that you find in South America. So a place where you know, there's a lot of exchange, a lot of, uh, of uh, mix between foreigners and nationals and uh, Sort of, and, and we actually found this place very quickly, which was very interesting because we really liked this yard, which was uh, you know, the sort of agora you're looking for, for people to walk around and exchange ideas in between different ethnies, different factions and things like this. Everything was destroyed here. We've actually kept the wall as it is. Uh, pretty much everything was like this, full of bullets. Aina functions as a unique model for innovative and successful international cooperation in Afghanistan by acting as a meeting place where both local and international non-governmental organizations can learn about each other and what it takes to communicate to the outside world. See if you can talk to the information ministry here and see if there are any other new TV stations as well. Because right? just need the house too small. Right? Then, uh, if we can have a bigger story about new TV stations, that would be nice. Yeah. I have uh, 50 correspondents who work regularly with me now. Just had a young man who's been to the Interior Ministry 10 times to get a quote. <laughs> and uh, uh, he, he eventually didn't get it, but what he did manage to get was a nice long bill of taxi fares that he's given me. So <laughs> I have to pay that up. But it was interesting that he, I was asking about what, what reaction did he get from the Ministry. And it was really along the lines of, well, why, why are you bothering me? Why should I talk to you? Because there is no history of inquiring journalism, and one of the ways around it is to simply not respond. So we've got a lot to do, both in terms of working with the people themselves and also working with the, if you like, the folks they have to deal with on a regular basis. Yeah, this is, sorry for the mess, this is the preparation for the courses. I just finished the interviews and uh, I'll show you these are, these are the applications for photo journalism courses, 300. This shows how people want to learn here, they have, you know, they want really to be in courses and unfortunately I have to choose 20 for the moment, so. <laughs> So some NGOs are specialized in training, some NGOs are specialized in setting up, setting up radios. Mm -hmm. So everybody knows what the other one is doing, so it's very easy to work in an effective way. But being truly effective in Afghanistan will require a sustained commitment from the West and an acceptance that establishing the groundwork for a democracy requires time and understanding. When it comes to Afghanistan, which one should always remember that it's an extremely, extremely complex situation that cannot be summarized or looked at quickly. You've got to spend some time here, you've got to understand what's going on, you've got to go back to the background. And it takes a lot of time, you have to be very humble in the way you approach the Afghan society. As a daughter of Afghanistan, Sima bears the complexity and humility of Afghan society within her. And even with the bullet-pocked walls, the spotty electricity, and the dearth of any serious Western commitment to reconstruction, her workshop is a lifeline to the outside world. Conceptualizing your idea takes time and thinking. In this class, all of you, each organization, will submit a proposal. And I hope that you will select a good project because we will help you try to put it nice in a nice proposal form so you could use it to give it to funding agencies. For Seema, her second week in Kabul is a validation of her skill and hard work. But there are still those who would keep her from restoring the rights and freedoms of her Afghanistan to the Afghanistan of the 21st century. When I ask conservative men about this, they say, well, this is against the Afghan tradition to do all these things for women. That women are, we just want, women have rights, yes, but uh, in their traditional role. 
that is totally false. I mean, that's a very good excuse to keep women subservient. Women always have played a very prominent role. As you know, in the 1920s, Afghan women had the right to vote. Uh, in the late 1920s, women were traveling to uh, gain higher education. And what did you think when you saw Kabul for the first time? I was devastated. I, although I had been in touch with Afghans, many who had been back and who were giving me eyewitness reports, I still have not come to terms with the level of destruction uh, in Kabul. I, it's, it was very. It's, 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 this has been the most difficult trip of my life. Um, returning, seeing home so destroyed and so destructed, and seeing. Um, the Afghan people driven so much into poverty and so traumatized. Uh, I also know that I am inspired that the uh, Afghan spirit is indomitable, and especially the women have done so much in um, the face of such repression and such trauma and poverty. And I think that's where, and I know that that's my role and my uh, responsibilities to help build from up from the ashes of when it's this cadre of the civil society who are democratic minded, who work across ethnicity, and who are women who have done phenomenal work. So this is what we have to support to do rebuilding. Do you understand? So you have to have an idea and you have to explain why I should select you to do this project. Why shouldn't I select her to do this project? She also trains vocationally. Through Seema's tireless efforts on the international stage, she has attracted the world's attention to the plight of Afghan women and men. But rebuilding Afghanistan has been hampered from the start by the West's continued tolerance for warlordism at the expense of the civil society that existed before the war. Rob Schultheis, the Time magazine correspondent who traveled with the Mujahideen, explained some of the persistent misperceptions about the role of warlords in Afghan society. Well, they're a totally un-Afghan phenomenon, and they were founded on an economy that was destroyed so that people are so desperate that people can pay them to do things they wouldn't normally do. But that's never, that's never happened here before, and you talk to Afghans, and to them it's uh, like we have warlords in America somewhere. Would you call that a direct result of the crisis that started in 79? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there, would never, there were never warlords or anything like that before. You never had a, some feudal, I mean, Three quarters of Afghan farmers owned their own land before, um, you know, before the war, at least, maybe more according to Dupree. And, um, you know, that still leaves uh, some impoverished people in urban, you know, and also landless farm workers. But I mean, that's for figure for a country like this is really amazing. Prior to the Marxist coup that put Afghanistan at ground zero in the Cold War and drove Seema from her country, Afghanistan had experienced a slow but steady progress towards power sharing and democratization. Women's rights, including the right to vote, had been granted in the 1920s, and though rural villages maintained traditional customs, Afghanistan's cities witnessed a rapid growth that fueled demands for modernization and broad social change. The extremism fostered by the war against the Soviets was as much a war against this social change as it was against the communist state apparatus. And as the war ground down the countryside, 100 years of progressive reforms went with it. Now Afghanistan must be taken back to the basics, but for many in the West who know only of the war against the Russians, conveying a complete picture of the Afghanistan that was lost is a frustrating exercise. I was so desperate to get story, atrocity stories out, basic, not atro you know, but stories of what I saw of suffering and, and uh, human rights violations that um, that was my only thought. And it was very hard to get them published, also, you have to remember. It wasn't easy, even given the fact that it was a right wing craze. I mean, there were several reporters over here who specialized in reporting on the Mujahideen from the very conservative point of view, you know, who faked footage. And, and uh, you know, fake news footage and stuff like this, and so they got a huge marquee for their work. 
you know, there, there are people who had that market sold out, sewed up. So if you were actually trying to do something real um, and cover these things, it was somewhat harder. People aren't dealing with some of the important issues, but they're, and one of the reasons is because they're complicated. And in a lot of ways, and, and the American public has not been really educated in such a way in the last generation or so to really start, start understanding some of these nuances. And so things get oversimplified. The women's issues, the burqa and all that, things get oversimplified. The, the, the status of the country, the, the terrorists, you know, I mean, half of the Taliban is running around still in the country and is back to farming or whatever. Do you, process, do you, do you send them to The Hague for war crimes or do you just let them get back on with their lives? All these kind of issues are, are difficult to understand even from an American point of view, and I think that, that, that makes it hard to really convey what's going on here, uh, or, and to really, ha to really somehow re report from here in ways that really make people back in the States understand in a, in a good way what's happening. And you just have to look at the, uh, the coverage um, on the right of Afghanistan, the same people who were calling the, the Afghans the brave soldiers of freedom. and. Blah blah blah. The moment the Russians were gone, were um, uh, you know turned it over to the Saudis and Pakistanis to do with it what they will, and uh, it was you know incredible cynicism of which uh, type you had not seen in American foreign policy so explicitly. It reminded me of the British, you know, at the height of their at the not the height, the downward turn of their empire where they just sold out anything for money. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're just events here that I don't understand. And, uh, and you know, I, I have a translator who helps me sometimes understand things, but sometimes he gets it completely wrong. So uh, it's, uh, you know, it's hard to sort things out. And, and, you know, journalism kind of demands you write things simply and clearly. And things aren't simple and clear. So it's, it's very hard, very hard here. It's a complicated place. So exactly what is happening in Afghanistan? And why, despite its heightened importance to the United States, do events there seem to remain beyond the scope of our understanding? There had been this kind of consciousness on the part of reporters that was fed to the American people. It was kind of a post-New Deal or Rooseveltian ideal, Wilsonian, Rooseveltian, and that's all gone now. So now people are taught this very cynical view of the world by journalists, and journalists pride themselves today on... on it would be almost better if they were all like... Uh, buried in the wall of the Kremlin, you know, uh, you know, or something, than what they're doing now. Because now they're determinedly, not only cynical, but they're unattractively cynical in that they're also greedy. And if you're cynical and not greedy, that's kind of neat. But if you're cynical and you are trying to make money and go to Hollywood, it's, you know, considerably less um, attractive. So I think, you know, this is only one story that's been victimized by this phenomenon, but it's certainly the most dramatic. You know, a year and a month ago, uh, I don't think we'd ever had a reporter in Afghanistan, you know, uh, and you know, part of that was because it wasn't possible under the Taliban. They weren't letting U.S. reporters in very often, um, but also, you know, just it wasn't on the radar. Twenty years ago, when Russian uniforms graced the streets of Kabul instead of American, Afghanistan loomed large on the radar. But the Cold War images that kept America enthralled disguised Afghanistan's long struggle to become a modern nation. Slowly emerging over centuries with an economy largely supported by the central government, the war in Afghanistan crippled an economy already devastated by years of drought and low-intensity warfare waged over the border from Pakistan. Aimed first at schools that educated women, the radical assault on all things modern pitted family member against family member and over a series of years wore down the fragile state of ethnic tolerance that had been established over centuries by the reigning dynasty. As radical Islamic warlords replaced tribal chieftains and mullahs as regional leaders, Afghanistan returned to a state not known since the days of Genghis Khan, and with the aid of numerous outside supporters, remained that way until the American bombing campaign drove the Taliban from the scene. Now Sima must begin again with a long tradition of Afghan rulers left unfinished. And as her class progresses in that final week, the women and men who've qualified for her course quickly adapt to the intensive training exercises. If you're asked what are objectives, you say objectives have to be smart. What are the qualities of objectives? 
In no. object we can measure about uh, about our thing. For example, it has to be measurable. Measure. Yeah, measurable. Measure. You have to be able to achieve it. I'm gonna give you a trick. A is for achievable. And R realistic. Sima maintains a close involvement as the proceedings move along, and as the class becomes more comfortable with the teaching process, the exchanges grow more open. So, who can give me the reasons quickly for why I have a game show? Quickly. Give me one. To evaluate your work. To evaluate, to, to enable others to evaluate our work. Don't waste the time. Not to waste our time because we become very clear. To organize our time. To organize our time too. What else? Right. Yes. To have a schedule for ourselves and to monitor our own activities. And one last thing. To design to make to make our budget. To make a budget. It enables us to think about budget items. Okay. Day by day, as their confidence grows, funding skills replace the survival tactics that kept them alive during the war. And as the workshop reaches its conclusion, the class demonstrates a sophisticated understanding of the skills necessary to access the pipeline for international aid. If another objective is to assist women to find employment, what would be my success indicator or my output? Of the women employed. 100% of the women employed. In other words, you, the output is something you have to do. You have to complete the activity. And if you can't complete the activity, you have to explain to the donor why you did not succeed. The point I'm trying to bring to you is that the rules of the budget are always the rules of the donor. And if you can, know some of these rules in advance in preparing the budget, you will be in better shape than just writing them and you don't know. It's like this is the indicator. As Seema, Michelle and Sohair tend to the last details of instruction, the air of intense concentration that had filled the room for the past week melts away and on the last day is replaced by excitement and celebration, topped off with chocolate, gifts of jewelry, and many warm thanks. The gifts are geared for women because I didn't know that men are going to be with us. So what I'm gonna do is they have a choice. If they don't like to have a necklace or an earring, <laughs> they can have chocolates. That's why I made the chocolate piles for the men. From touchdown at Kabul airport to the presentation of awards and diplomas, Seema's return trip to her hometown has been a life-affirming experience for all. But for the women of Afghanistan, Seema's return assumed a special importance. While reflecting the indomitable spirit that kept Afghan culture alive through 24 years of conflict. <laughs> And she says, as a woman who has um, uh, suffered the war, she uh, makes the commitment that whatever um, she gains from here, to uh, that she has actually stayed through, uh, throughout the whole entire process, uh, committing her work to her Afghan sisters, and that she will continue to do so. What had begun as apprehension for Seema has ended with joy as the strength, uniqueness, and beauty of the old Afghanistan again reveals itself to the women and men. And though a vast international effort is needed to rebuild from the ruins, this first vital step has gone a long way toward restoring the hope and the dreams that all Afghans, men and women, will someday enjoy the blessings of equality and freedom they had been promised during their darkest night.
you our discussion leader this morning, Seema Wali. At the time I fled Afghanistan, after the 1978 Marxist coup, my family was placed under house arrest simply because, as allies to the West, we belonged on the wrong side of Afghan politics. I left behind a culture striving on the path of democracy and giving a voice to women. I was accustomed to visibility and contributions of women. Uh, I was exposed to empowered women, women both in my own immediate family and the larger society who held cabinet posts, uh, worked alongside men in government. I still grieve for the Afghanistan I left behind and the lost opportunities for the democratic-minded Afghan people. During the past 23 years, I made a promise to myself and to my people that I would help them rebuild democratic institutions. I promised my people that I would help keep them and their voices and their struggle alive. But until the downfall of the Taliban refuge, my organization was unable to conduct its programs inside Afghanistan. Now, with an office in Kabul, I am finally able to fulfill my promise. But the promise of bringing democracy and human rights to Afghan women and men continues to face serious obstacles. What the world has seen of Afghanistan in the last decades is not the Afghanistan of my father or mother. It is not the Afghanistan of tolerance and beauty that I knew as a young woman. In fact, the Afghanistan that grew from the ruins of the war against Russia was not an Afghanistan of this world at all. The Taliban's draconian edicts represented an entirely new form of organized violence against women. Termed gender apartheid, the moral, spiritual, and human crisis provoked by this unique form of cruelty galvanized the world's women for the first time to the idea that even the most basic of human rights can be lost. But in that lesson, for the women of the world, Afghan women were the canaries in the mine shaft, warning that an ever greater danger was fast approaching. Today, Afghanistan is still not free from such radical ideas hijacked by foreign extremists, our traditions and our religion have been twisted against us while the media has often failed to recognize the Afghan people were themselves hostages in their own land. For the duration of the Taliban rule that enslaved Afghan women, I carried their pleading voices and their screams while the world looked the other way. Now I must plead for the world to look at us again and see what we all will become unless a new will and determination to establish democracy can be found. International law and diplomacy broke down in Afghanistan. That system and the spiritual values that supported it must now be restored to end the mass human tragedy. Afghanistan lost two million people for siding with the U.S. in the war to bring an end to communism. We deserve better. Now that we have a semblance of a new government and a new society, the Afghan people are again apprehensive. Although 9-11 was a wake-up call that U.S. security relies on a stable Afghanistan, I fear that we will be abandoned once again. Today, while strides have been made to bring women along in reconstruction schemes, these advances are tempered with lack of security, rampant poverty, unemployment, violence against women, and the lack of basic amenities. The common Afghan men and women have fear in their hearts and uncertainty about their future. Although some gains have been achieved in removing a repressive regime, women remain at risk and I remain highly concerned about the Taliban mentality in ruling circles. And as an Afghan and an American, I will testify to you 
that the argument against women's rights is neither Afghan nor Islamic. The world community must not acquiesce with rhetoric. We who are concerned about the fate of our Afghan sisters must challenge developments in Afghanistan. What Afghanistan and its women desperately need as they emerge from a protracted war and an anguished history of intervention is not misplaced charity, but long-term strategies for sustainable democracy. How we achieve that is what I have spent 25 years of my life doing as president of Refugee Women in Development.